Hello, everybody. Welcome to the live stream. Boy, have I got some fun stuff set for you guys today. My gosh. We have a new library that is just... This is back to the 80s. I love this in Dark Alley. Let's go get some drums. I love the pitch. It's so cool. So this is a new library by Bob Dedes. He has done two other libraries before this one that if you guys don't have, you should check out. Renegade is cinematic trailer effects, fully body percussion, drums, guitars, bass, everything you need to do really cool. I mean, here just, oh, actually, I need to go over there. Load to the layer. And um, here, here's Haze and Shouts. Hey, 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 hey. Risers and Drops. All the Foley and all this kind of stuff. His second library in a complete 180 direction went into the ambient categories with all these incredible things that are like... One note just takes you... Beautiful stuff. Incredible, like 240 patches. There's ambient guitars. Unbelievable. Well, his third library, he's done a 180 yet again and tackled something that a lot of people aren't really brave enough to tackle, and that is to do 80s. Because 80s was a really tricky genre and a tricky era because so much diversity was there, and it was the more complex levels of synth programming because synthesizers had gotten more evolved. And so for this library, Bob was very smart and relied on Vital, which is a very powerful synthesizer. Actually, let me get up here to the uh, BPM sequence stuff here. To, to call up and use in a, actually some really creative ways. If you look at the patches that he created for this library. Um, but these sounds. This is all vital. Now, to get this library to work, you do need to own Vital. If you don't know about Vital, that is available from vital.audio. Let me show you really quick just the, the steps here. So vital.audio, um, if you scroll down, you'll see that you have four options for getting the synthesizer. A subscription, basic, which means free. The plus for $25, you get 250 additional presets for pro. You get 400 presets in total. Um, if you can afford to do more than the free, please do so. If you can't, it's free. And the free version works just perfectly fine for getting this library to work. You do need to use 1.5.5. And I just went through this with Steve Picaro, where if you download and install Vital the first time and sign up and sign in, when you go to Vital, you'll click right here in the corner and it won't say 1.5.5, it'll say 1.0.7. When you try to load up the patches, you're going to see brackets because it can't load. Uh, so you need to go back to the Vital website, log into your account, and 1.5.5 will be there for you to download. Update. Now you load up the patches and everything works. So th this is a library that is a complete passion for the 80s love fest. I mean, the sounds the production, and you don't need anything else but Vital and Unify. I mean, it just sounds so awesome. Look at these guitars. These are in Vital. Big basses.
I mean, it's, you know, I'm watching a Stranger Things kind of a scene before my eyes, right? And then down below that are these BPM templates. These call up a drum groove and then the sounds to nail all these killer songs. And we set it up so that the bass and the brass and everything are on different MIDI channels over here. So you can call this up in your DAW and immediately start to write using these sounds. And if you want to hear what these sound like incomplete, I can do it this way. I can go over here, plug in Guru. I have special guests to join me in a minute, so don't you dare go away. I've got Steve Picaro and Bob both ready to say hi to everybody. So let's see here. I can go over here to my account and say log out. Um, come over here. Sounds of the 80s. The very first demo we put up here called Mixtape. Play this. Welcome to Plug In Guru Radio FM 89. Here are some of the hottest this hits. Straight out of, of Unify. I mean, it's great. You got all these parts to play with. Pads, bass. Little Madonna action. Little Phil Collins. It keeps going. So I'm not going to play the whole thing, but there's this demo as well as a plethora of other demos. Uh, <laughs> Welcome to the 80s has my daughter's voice at the beginning. She, Bob, Bob said, hey, I have a crazy idea. I want you, have you, have you, because he wanted his girlfriend, but she has an accent and he wanted more of the American voice. And so I had my daughter say the lines. And so if you want to hear what my daughter Hannah sounds like, she's on the Welcome to the 80s track, <laughs> stuff like that. So at PlugInGuru.com, you can get to this library. There's two versions of the library I should point out. There's one version that is the Vital Patches only. What this means is that you can run Vital and you can go right here to the patch list and install the MC back to the 80s. And it will give you 188 Vital Patches. And these are not your normal Vital Patches. There's samples in some of them. They're using synthesis in some really cool ways. Some have like even orchestra hit samples and all sorts of stuff. Everything you need to nail the 80s. All these patches also show up in the Unify version along with these custom composed BPM sequences that Bob has composed. I mean, it just sounds so legit. I mean, it's just, it's got that thick 80s, Juno 60, Juno 106, big warm chords. Also notice this, there is a knob on the macro knobs this is VHX mix. This is with it on. With it, with it off, it sounds like a CD. You hear more Christmas and bright. Turn it up. And you can even filter it more. It just sounds so good. <laughs> Plus you have the mix over here so you can say drums out. Ready to go. I mean, it's just, it's a great library. I mean, Bob, this is his third home run to have all these sounds. So the Unified version takes it a step farther for only $20 more. And at the introductory price, it's actually only $15 or so more than the vital patches by themselves. If you have Unify, you get all of these drum patterns, all this really cool stuff. After our interview with Steve Picaro and with Bob Dedes, I will show you the library with more detail. So if you want to stay around for that, I will show you that. But at this point, I think we're going to shift gears and bring my guests. I don't get to have guests on that often. So I get, I get very excited. This is definitely me being skippy because I get to have guests on my little live stream. So I'm really excited about that. So please say hello to Steve Picaro. One of the session players that played on literally every track that I just showed you. <laughs>
and Bob Dedes, who created this library and is in Greece. So hello, hello everyone. Hello guys. Hello, hello. So my gosh, I don't even know where to say. So Bob, why did you tackle this? Why did you? What's the reason to to do this? Well, uh, first and foremost, my love for the eighties. Not just the music. I mean the movies. This decade has a special place in my heart. I don't know how it happened or why, but and I've heard many people say that they have the, this nostalgia, although they never lived in the eighties. And I have thought about it. You know, I was born in eighty uh, three, so I I actually um, I um, I lived mostly through the nineties. But with the the culture that I remember living was the nineties. Right, but. With the movies and the music that was, um, you know, um, coming to my hands from from CDs that they were distri distributing with newspapers. That's how I collected my first CDs that they had '80s music, '80s pop music, '80s um, you know rock music and all that stuff. And I fell in love with it, and I was always in love with it. And I, you know, as I was growing older, I was listening more and more, and I was searching and searching. And you know it's a it's a very special decade. That's the whole thing. That's the whole, um, yeah, idea for me. Wow, very special. Wow. Well, I am so glad that you did this because, and, and I want I want to make it really clear. This is Bob's library. I did very little other than some secretarial work of pulling out drums and so forth from the, the everything you're hearing. I, I've seen credits. People giving me credit, and I, I this is not my library. Bob came to me and said. I have a crazy idea. I'm going to do the 80s. And I'm going to use Vital. And I'm like, cool. And then a couple months later, you won't believe how this is turning out. Oh my gosh, I'm so excited. It's so amazing. And he would send me audio of a few of the things he was working. I'm like, that is okay. He's So this has been a vision that has been planted in Bob's mind and carried out to where it is 100%. I'm just happy to be here to represent it and bring it to him and Share it with you all. So good job, man. It's a great library. Very, very well done. Thank you so much. Mr. Pocaro, my friend. How hey are you? I'm very good. I'm very good. I'm in my happy place. <laughs> Studios are a happy place, right? Yes. Well, let's 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 go back a little, because you you lived through the eighties, as I did, but you were actually I was I graduated high school in 82, moved to Seattle in 85, moved to Los Angeles in 88. So during that whole era that I was moving around and growing up, you were working in the studios on all these different projects and so forth. And uh, what was that like? It was amazing. It was it was incredible. Uh, um, it was also very, very challenging. And dealing with the synths then, just especially in the studios where you needed to tuning was everybody was microscoping things like tuning and you'd get a great sound up. And I'm, you know, whether you're talking about a CS80 or a Jupiter 8 or a, or even later the, the Oprahheim stuff, just tuning was always an issue. My uh, yeah. Prophet 5 that even had a, a tune button on it <laughs> and was trolled was constantly out of tune by people that were being very discerning. Um, um, you know, that was one issue. So, I mean, a lot of uh, um, it's funny for me to see sometimes people fetishizing over some of this older stuff that uh, they have no idea uh, the downside of uh, uh, they're spoiled by the I'm, I get spoiled now by these plugins, uh, you know, that I mean, that are just right. You bring them up and is never an issue. As a matter of fact, my my ES2 has a knob on it that it can put it out of tune with itself. You know what I mean? Which cracks me up to actually to have that. Right. I have to suck with everything being nailed all the time. Right. You know right. What I mean? You have to have some sort of a humanizing thing to take it out from being perfect. Right. <laughs> Which to use. I, I just suffer with it all being in tune all the time. I know. You know? It's, it's, well, and it's uh, funny because like that amazing chorus of the 80s, it's like, no, that's because we couldn't tune the three parts that we're playing. <laughs> Right. But no, it was it was great, though, having that experience of having to uh, um, uh, 
of deliver of of going in and there was like talk about deadlines talk about uh, right. needing deadlines where you're there with a producer and an engineer yep. and the studio clock is running at 350 bucks an hour and the artist is there and yeah you've got three hours to do the synths on four tunes right i mean it was great it was a great boot camp right. uh, uh and i you know i i then i had very limited means as far as you know what I mean? When you had a CS80, I knew it backwards and forwards. I knew my Prophet 5 backwards and forwards. Right. I knew my Mini Moog with my DS2 sequencer backwards and forwards. So there wasn't a whole lot of like poking through presets. Uh, um, yeah. Especially there was something about not having, not being able to store sounds where on my, on my, on my uh, um, Prophet 5, the first row of eight, I always knew where all my best sounds were because I would copy, say, my string pads into a right. another bank. I would play King of the Hill. I would A and B. I would tweak the sound and then I'd A and B it with who was in that number one slot. And, you know, if it beat it, if I really took my time and listened to it with fresh ears, I would replace it. So I always knew of the sounds that I used for that particular synthesizer right. Right. where my best sounds were. Right. Despite what studio I was in or what the monitoring system was like or or where I was in the mix, yeah. I always knew where my best sounds were. As soon as I was able to save them on cassette, as soon as I was able to store them offline, I wound up with 20 cassettes that said <laughs> best string sound. I never knew where my best string sound was again. <laughs> yeah, because you didn't have the time at a session to like get the tape player to work right and hook up and play. And What I mean. Anyway, there was just... Uh, uh, um, you know, and of course now, uh, you know, I, you know what I mean? And I wouldn't live without being able to save my sounds, but it's right. funny, the, some of the limitations that actually were, you look back and they were helpful in a way. Yeah. I was watching an interview with uh, Jam and Lewis and actually mainly with Jimmy Jam. He's got far more personality than I thought that I, I've never met him in person. And he was giving a tour of a studio and he, he was at his um, OBX. He goes, this factory patch, and it was just a nice, snappy synth waveform, slightly detuned. He goes, this is what started every one of my patches. He goes, I would go to this because I knew how to take that sound and then deviate it to whatever I needed for whatever was needed. If it needed to be a short and plucky or, you know, whatever, you kind of would work that way. We'd have a map patch that would be like your starting point, And then you knew where to go from there for what was needed for the session, right? You know, that first Janet Jackson album, I oh. Jimmy Jam is my hero. Oh my was, god, dude. He was my hero. And you gotta give credit to his engineer, Steve Hodge. Yes. You know, the engineer, yes. their guy, uh yeah, um probably sure. had a lot to do with some of the way those sounds, how striking they were. But Jimmy Jam, as far as especially the way he would take samples and put them oh, yeah. way out of which is the stuff that guy Sigsworth is doing now in right. pro. Right. That's so cool. Guys yeah. taking stuff way out of their range. Uh, but Jimmy Jam in the in the eighties there, yeah. he was my hero. Yeah. You yeah. know, I was trying to get my stuff to sound like that. <laughs> and I'll never forget the keyboard magazine. They're on the cover of Keyboard Magazine. And I was uh um my OB8, my Oberheim at, had they they came out with this new version of it and it had page two. It had twice as many features on it as they had previously had. And uh and I read this Jimmy Jammer, and I know they used he used OB8 on a lot of these sounds you're talking about. He used right. an Oberheim on it. And uh I'm reading this with bated breath, waiting to hear like the 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 secrets. And sure enough, the uh uh interviewer asked him, Do you ever use page two? How do you use page two on the OB8? And his answer was, No, never. <laughs> you know, just what he would do, what he would play right. with. The most basic stuff. Well, he shows, more. if you got, I'll have to find a link. I'll put a thing in our chat, but he goes, so this is the steel drum patch and he plays the steel drum and he goes, but it's actually the bass for lately. And he plays it down low and it's the bass. I was like, okay, what, what have you done for me lately? That, that, that keyboard part in yeah. that song. And he played like it. It's just so, he still plays it so funky to this day. It's just like, okay, that's, that's the Minneapolis, you know, he grew up with that. I mean. He was my hero. Yeah, mine, mine too. For still is. So, uh, wow. Well, did you ever do Cartage? 
you had did you ever have the big racks and teams carrying around all your gear and setting up at later dates always i mean my very very first session sure i'd bring my mini moog and my sequencer you know what i mean in my car or whatever but um yeah leeds musical instrument rentals my best friend andy leeds growing up had a cartridge company and um uh, there were a couple couple guys that got really good at setting up my my setup that became more and more elaborate. But uh, you know, a CS80 was two hundred and fifty pounds. Right. I wasn't going to be able to walk into a session with that <laughs> under my arm. And did you have software like Galaxy or something keeping track of all of your setups and so forth? Later. Like later on, yes. Later on, I started in like seventy eight. Right. You know. Yeah. During, right. But he said. This is that was all much later, but I was way into Galaxy. I loved. I was a hardcore Vision guy, and was broken hearted when Hopgood went away. Yeah. You know, yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, I had Galaxy. I had all that stuff. It was great. Wow. Well, here I'll open up for some questions from the group chat. There's a lot of people here that are enjoying our conversation. Um, I could just say one thing. You know that Bob yeah. this. But little I've seen from this 80s collection, he's really captured the spirit of the times. You know what I mean? When I hear some of these things um, and I know just on a very practical matter for guys who are trying to do this and make a living that some of the library companies that have been approaching me, I know in the next couple of years, they've told me it's going to there's going to be a ton. What they're going to be looking for is 80s stuff and Yacht Rock in particular and uh this library, I think, is going to come in real handy for a lot of people. I mean, the timing couldn't be more perfect, I yeah. think. Wow, Steve. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yes. Especially <laughs> the best. Do it. You really captured the spirit of a lot of these these records that I just remember being on the radio and uh, uh, um, did a great job. Yeah, I Thank I totally so agree. I don't know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Steve, tell me what you were saying earlier about the 80s sounds. How, they're difficult to capture and create and capture this essence that Bob has done. They're not, it doesn't just happen automatically. Well, and again, a lot of times, I think this is why what makes Unify so cool is that a lot of the sounds then were these combinations. They just weren't, you know, now when I get up certain synths I love, like Zebra or whatever, the or Omnisphere, you know, there's such great synths that the sound is there. Boom. I've been able to combine a sample with an analog thing, and I've got this great, huge sound. In those days, we were doubling. We were adding a DX7 to a CS80 to a this, right. that, make, uh, trying to make those sounds. And so they were very difficult to just hit save and then have that to tour with. You know what I mean? Yeah. It wasn't a preset, you know, every time I'd go on the road, it'd be like, okay, now how am I going to pull this off? How am I going to fake this thing I did on the record that I used five cents on, you know? Yeah. Can I say something Absolutely. about uh, what Steve says? I mean, uh, I have thought about this a lot of times, you know, back then they were making sounds, sound designers. There were so many people involved in making sounds in an album, you know, uh, backstage people there were these synthesizers full of in imperfections and people uh, were spending so much time trying to figure out things out and there was not this competition that is this now where you see everything uh, and you can uh, immediately try to go after a specific sound there were so many things, I think, that uh, they were part of that sound of the 80s. You know, it, it, it was much more complex then. Well, everything, remember, everything. MIDI, MIDI came about in 1982. So for a lot of the 80s, it was artists experimenting, really. It's like, oh, I can connect this to this and this. Well, what if I connect five? You know, I mean, you could do things that you couldn't do before in the 70s because it couldn't lay unless you played the parts with two hands on two keyboards. Now you could call up a really huge sound and have a DX7 and two other synthesizers playing the same part. And so that's what kind of led to the feast of big sounds of the 80s, you know, because you could. It's like that was that was you couldn't do it before. So it's like anytime you can all of a sudden drive 100 miles an hour in your car, boom, you want to drive 100 miles in your car. 
Now, what's what 120 feel like? You know? so, yeah. Right? Did you would you find that you were you were there? Did you guys would spend time experimenting with layering and like, well, plug this in. Let's let's add more to this. Are you asking me? Yeah. Well, you oh, were I there. You, the <laughs> oh no, absolutely. The the uh, you know what I mean. I had trying to get string sounds made me do this deep dive in the fact that they didn't exist. And, and I would work with producers that were always saying, that's good, but can you make it sound a little more like real strings? And then I would make an adjustment. I'm just talking about analog synths. We're talking about Prophet 5s and CS80s and stuff. And right. they'd, I'd listen to it and go, yeah, that's better, but can you make it sound a little more like real strings? And after the third time, I wanted to throttle the guy and I wanted to say... <laughs> My real string knob is all the way up. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what and uh, um, so with emulators, I had my first emulator modified so I could shut down the sustain of it because the attack, right? I learned from reading all these music, physics of music magazines that right. the attack. The rosin. That rosin. Attack, yeah. About it, whether it was the trumpet sound or a violin bow scraping, that it was all about the attack. And so emulators did that great. They only had two seconds of sampling, you know? So right. I think that would be great. But those, the way they looped, the loop they went into sounded <laughs> <laughs> something or worse. You or know what worse. I mean? I, Jim Cooper did a mod where I was able to shut down the sustain. So I could only use just the attack. And I had that with right. this elaborate, again, this is pre-MIDI even at the time, just CV and gate set up. Um, right. My Jupiter, they sustained beautifully. My Jupiter 8s with an analog string sound, it was nice. And I could adjust the release and, right. and uh, the combination of the two. Now, very soon after that, sure enough, uh, I, uh, Roland came out with a D50. Right. That used I was going to say you were doing like the D50 thing. <laughs> M1 then, you know what I mean? And yeah. and stuff started changing then. But when Roland, I think, was the first one to really come out with these long string samples. Mm -hmm. I, like all my synth friends were like, oh, that's cheating. I was like, you know what? I'm done. I don't need <laughs> They're doing this is all I've been trying to do right. all these years. I'm done with this because all of this was all about me writing, being able to write songs and, and deliver sounds like that. Right, um, right. I got to tell you, you know, so I want to use synths, you know, I want to use synths for stuff that conventional stuff can't do. I mean, sure, I'm always going after a great horn sound and a great convincing string sound. But uh, yeah, I love the fact that I now have a real string knob I can put up to 10. You know right, what I mean? Right, right, right. Get the rosin vibe and, and more. You know, and that so that that was a thing in the 80s but you know what so sometimes i think what a drag i had to spend all that time studying sound away from music you know what i mean uh um trying to get convincing string sounds that now our people don't have to think about they're they're you know what i'm saying they grow up with that done but you know what i learned a lot about sound on the way right. that has served me in other ways right totally yeah it it all feeds into your genetic makeup to actually have to think farther under the surface than just calling up a preset, right? Yeah. Bob, you had something you want to say? No, I'm just enjoying the conversation. Okay. <laughs> I can hear you for hours. I was going to tell you, um, I, I was really um, surprised. It's, speaking of string sound, Steve, um, Scent Strings A is just the most perfect. It's just got enough that real but not real vibe I came across this in the live stream and I almost wanted to like stop and play it for a long time instead of having to keep going on and showing all the other patches and stuff but I was really it's well done so well done so the first it, time that I oh okay no go ahead go ahead yeah so the first time that I came across uh, synth sounds basically was when uh, uh, my folks bought me a Clavinova piano, which is a Yamaha, yeah, uh, with, and it has you know syn synthetic sounds in it, and that was my first piano that I had, electric piano, and it has all all these rhythms and sounds. And I was you know at some point 
I was, oh, I need to find real sounds, not this synthetic, but now I love the sounds, actually. <laughs> this synthetic yeah. sound. My mom has sold Clavanova's at the music store. P oh, part of my okay. background, it's really funny. I, um, My mom and dad owned music stores for all, all my life. And they sold Yamaha pianos. And because of my love for uh, pop music and stuff, the DX7 came out and they, they, the piano tuner, this technician in Ontario, Oregon, drove me to a uh, Portland, Oregon, to the Red Lion to see Bo Tomlin and everybody introduced the DX7. And that's, I spent three days learning programming on a DX7. That's where I learned my craft wow. started at that experience. It was, it was really, really fun. Bo but was the guy. Bo's the guy. And I actually, um, this, I part of, I belong to a little, little synth, synth programming club and, uh, his contact information has been circulated so I can say hi to him again. Cause I haven't talked to him in a while, but, uh, yeah, Bo Tomlin got deeper into FM than anybody I know, as far as the, the fixed Hertz frequencies for operators that would be used for piano sounds to create the har in harmonics in the piano and wonderful stuff. But, uh, yeah, Clavinova's uh, and Yamaha Lectone organs. My, I had the keys to my mom's music store. So when it, the early days of MIDI was uh, me taking a DX11 and a RX5 and MIDIing the two, and you could change the note that each drum pad would send. So you could have it, so it'd have a kick and a snare. And then the other notes, I would sequence things and have those play notes that I would like tune to like make some sort of a weird arpeggio thing from the drum pattern from back in the day. Uh, so yeah, we've come a long way since then to where now it's just call it up and push a button and it's and it and it does the dance for you automatically. So well, this is great. Um, let me see if there's any questions here. Um, Steve, what is your DAW of choice? People are asking. Since vision is no Sorry, longer I available. Your sequencer, DAW, work, what workstation environment do you work in mostly? Do I work in? Logic. Me, yeah, my platform these days is Logic, and I kind of have, a, a, you know, very much a love hate. Yeah. Mostly hate relationship. <laughs> but uh, um, getting better. Yeah. It's getting better. It's about time, but it's getting better. Yeah. You know, uh, but. Uh, you know, I kind of have everything. I I kind of dabble. I own Cubase. I own Ableton Live. I own Pro Tools and keep them current because uh, yeah, I'll jump around. They've all different features that's that are. I mean, I don't deep dive into any of the other ones like I do Logic, but uh, some of them have some amazing features that I just are worth it to me. That yes. are are so uh, agreed, so amazing. I'm able to do certain things and jump into uh, yeah. Uh, other ones just for uh, some specialized feature they do. Yeah, yeah. And Bob, what's your DAW? What, what, what's your environment that you like to work in? I I always uh, was using Cubase. Okay. I have been always a Cubase user. I kind of wished I was always wished I was a Cubase guy. You know, some of the things that you? used to be so. But yeah, some of the things that are so challenging in logic are, are I mean, yeah, you know, are, that are so challenging in logic are non-issues in Cubase, you know? Oh, uh, okay. I don't know, unfortunately, about logic, so I cannot compare them. I don't know at all what is going on. Yeah. Multi-tambral, you know, multi-tambral synthesizers, which is something coming from the 80s. I right. was always wanting to address the separate MIDI channels of a multi-tambral. Right, right. Or, Kids these days go just do another instance, and I'm like, yeah, but it should be able to. Yeah, well, you deal can. That logic is. Let's talk afterwards. I can show you how to yeah. do that, so it can do it. <laughs> okay. like it's got better. I'm I'm getting better at it in logic, yes. but it uh, uh, there's some other things too that are just yeah. uh, uh, it, non well, issues. It's, it's, yeah, know? it's it's you have this picture in your mind, and and it's interesting that the tools are sometimes such a challenge to get what you have in your mind to come out the speakers, you know? It's it's not as easy as it you wish it would be, you know? Some, someday maybe we'll get closer to that. Um, let me see some of the questions that we have here. Um, Steve, have you had a chance to play with some of the newer synths, like the Osmos? 
Uh, I have not played with Osmos. I, I've, uh, um, you know, like I said, back in the day, there was just, you know, I had a 2600, I had this, I had a mini Moog, a, a, a Prophet, you know, and I wound up getting into the Polyfusion modular stuff, but, um, uh, which was kind of this open-ended breadboard of, you know what I mean, of, yeah. of, of, of learning. And I learned so much about synthesis on it, but now... Probably one of the newest things I've gotten into is Zebra. Okay. You know, so many of these other things, there's so much great stuff out there. And um, yeah. whereas I'm not above poking through presets mm -hmm. and, and just kind of poking through presets, I'm always frustrated when I do that because I want to get in there right away. I'll hear something and it'll be like, God, that's a great sound. But where's the speed of that LFO? I want to right, right. slow right. that down. You know what I mean? I'm always wanting to get under the hood. So being that finish at this point in my life, finishing songs is my priority. I have to pick and choose. I get so easily seduced by the technology and new stuff. And there's just so much of it. Yes. There's just a bunch of angles. I got to go. You know what? I've got to put the blinders on and just kind of look at this. And, and uh, there's enough stuff that seduces me. That I that I think you know what this is really going to help me finish my songs, so I'm going to spend my time learning that. I'm constantly chasing clouds, stuff. right? <laughs> I totally understand that. I totally understand that. I have to choose. I got to be real, or I'll be just be in the manual. Yes. I'll be on YouTube videos all yeah. day, not making music. Yeah, you know. Hey, a dear friend of mine, Ryland. Do you know Ryland Allison? He worked with Eric Persing on the sound design for. Um, Oh, what's the the, the uh, distorted reality? Remember when that CD library came out? Kidding! Nothing yeah. was used more in the film world than distorted reality. Those I mean, were... it was incredible. So Ryland is asking about one of my personal favorite albums, what you played on, which was James Newton Howard and Friends. Mm -hmm. What yes. was that experience like? It was amazing for me because it was direct to disc. I'm right. Such, that was uh, one pass, uh, right? Hmm. One pass. You 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 had to yeah. get it. Studio rat. And what was cool? This was our that that came from us demonstrating for Yamaha. We had done uh, one was before there was DX sevens, and one was after there were DX sevens. Um, where we we would do these demo things at NAMM shows. I had this great relationship with Yamaha. Right. They were treating me good, and I put together this kind of all keyboard band. And initially, we did it with a drum machine with an LM one. Uh, but then later on, my brother Jeff would come yes. and join us. Um, Some of those and, grooves uh, were just so incredible. You know, James Newman Howard, David Page, my partner in Toto, and myself were the three keyboard players. And uh, um, we all had tunes yes. that we used, these kind of synth jams. I was typically paying, playing bass most of the time. And uh, yeah, one was, like I said, pre-DX7s when it was just GS1s and I still had my CS80 up there. And, and wow. uh, um, but later on, we, we were able to do it with just all DX7s. Anyway, on one of them, um, Bill Schnee happened to be at the NAMM show. And we were doing five, six, what, six demos a day. You know, we were doing right. six six of these mini sets a day in, in a booth at NAMM and yeah. uh, in this little room at NAMM. Bill Schnee saw it and he brought in he had this was uh, associated with this direct to disc company and brought in uh, the guy who was the head of that and said, wouldn't this make a great direct to disc album? So we kind of knew this stuff really well, but it still was very high pressure doing right. a whole album at the time. So that's what was cool about that. And to to document that stuff in a very cool way. Wait, you know? so you did the entire not just song, but the album in one pass? Inside at a time, we'd have to do like four songs in a row without stopping. And if you screwed up on the third song, you'd have to do the whole thing over. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. Oh my direct god! Disc. Right. Once they started, you couldn't stop. You know, I was scared to death. <laughs> Me, and my brother Jeff was playing drums. Paige and James were on it, and my dad was actually also playing percussion with us. And oh, cool! Uh, old pros, and uh, um, you know, we're used to very high pressure you know, high pressure situations, but I was scared to death that I was going to start oh, rushing, man. like, or do something. Wow. Horrible. 
Yeah. No, and the credit really goes to Bill Schnee, where on the mixing board, he didn't know the whole, you know, he had just kind of learned this stuff. And our sounds were constantly changing midstream in the middle of a song. A certain fader would go from being a bass sound to being a some completely different synth sound. And he was having to deal with that the whole time. Oh, my gosh. That's crazy. Hey, Jack Hotop is here. Did he, uh, Jack is asking, uh, did you play or do programming on She's a Beauty? I sure did. Yeah, I, I um, that was one of those uncomfortable situations where I, I'd been working with David Foster a lot. And uh, but Mike Cotton, there's a name that's not talked about enough. Right. Everybody listened to the album Young and Rich by the tubes. Young okay. and Rich. Young and Rich. Okay. Did with Ken Scott and the synth work on it. I mean, all his synth work throughout the tubes career was amazing, but especially on that album. So when Foster was producing them and gave, you know, I got the call like I usually did on Foster stuff. I'm like, wait a minute. That's another band with two keyboard players. You know, Vince Welnick would play the usually the basic, you know, piano Rhodes parts. And they had Mike Cotton, this amazing synthesis in the band. Um, and I knew Mike's specialty was 2600. So right. Mike was going to join us. I made sure, first of all, that he joined us on the session. And I had um, I had my own and then I had a second one. I had two 2600s set up, ready to go. <laughs> and uh, that Mike was in on the session with us. And actually, James walked in and played a part. James Howard walked in and played a part on She's a Beauty. That was the big single we were working on. But a lot of those big explosions and sound effects, that's all Mike Cotton on uh, uh, 2600, you know. Wow. Well, there you go. It was great. That's a great question. Young and Rich. Everyone check out that album by the yeah. tubes. Okay, that's on my list now. Young and Rich. Yeah. As far as synth stuff goes. Right. Right. Wow. Well, was there anything higher pressure for you than the James Newton Howard sessions? No, that was the highest pressure, you know, or watching or having someone like Jack Hotop watch me play or something like that. <laughs> Uh, Jack Hotop's one of my one of my heroes and yes. one of my friends. Jack, Jack Guys, is a dear brother. I mean, are, I've exploited their work and your work quite a bit over the years, yes. and uh, you, you guys are the guys. You know what I mean? Behind the talk, I thought I was a behind the scenes guy. Well, you know what I mean. Um, um, everyone's telling me, you know, sometimes I'd get props for getting up a good sound and. Uh, um, I wouldn't, sometimes I didn't know who it was, where it came from. Then I got to eventually meet. Right. Meet Mr. Cord. Meet. For those of you who don't yeah. know, Jack Hotop is a dear friend of mine. He was part of the team that decided to hire me when I did a dog and pony. I did a red eye flight from Seattle to New York and presented the M1 to Jack Hotop and Ben Dowling and a couple of people that were the management at Korg. And he was one of them that gave the green light. And Jack has been the heart and soul of the Korg sounds since the Poly 800. So he's made patches for virtually every workstation synth. The M1, T-Series, O1W, Wave Stations. And I've been blessed to be involved since the M1 with him sitting in rooms in Japan when we did. Before the internet, we used to actually go to Japan and actually meet four or five times during the making of one synthesizer. We would actually sit in a room, Jack would have his sounds, I would have my sounds, Michael Geisel from Germany would have his sounds, Michele Pachuli from Italy would have his sounds, and we would fight. We would actually play patches, vote, and then we would stand up and argue why our patch should be in instead of somebody else's patch. And that's how Korg's voicing used to be done, was in person, everybody wanting the best for the voicing. And so Korg synthesizers for a number of years had a, a level of detail to the voicing and a lot of that was because jack felt it was important we did it this way uh, we don't do it that way anymore now it's all spreadsheets and voting in excel and somebody else usually makes the decisions besides us but we have many years and we we, we get on the phone and we'll talk about the memories of sitting in these little tiny rooms and playing the sounds for hours and hours and voting and then we'd all sit around the final piano patch had been selected for the t-series and we would all stand around it and like, decay should be 83. No, 82. It's, it's too slow at 82. It needs to be one more. 
I mean, it was that level of detail together to do the voicing for the synthesizers, which was really That was cool. in the 80s? In, in the 80s? In the 80s, 80s and 90s, yeah. For me, more than 90s. I I joined Korg in 88, 89. So they, it was the, the way before the internet took off in the later 90s, but in that early 80, late 80s, 90s, it was very, they, Korg flew me business class to Japan. I mean, you know, don't do that anymore. Um, but we would go for a program. We would go, we would, because they would send us a prototype, no manual. There'd be a piece of paper on the top that would show you. In fact, here, if you want to see something, I can see if I can find this really quick. Because I'm, I'm in the process of, process of packing to, to move. I'm going to be relocating closer to my mom and dad. And uh, I can show you. I, I, I don't know if you guys on the, the chat with me will see this because... I have to, well maybe I can share the screen, but this is a I am this is a prototype. Let's see, where is it? Where did I put it? This is one of the prototypes for uh oh I don't want to hold the show for this. Oh uh, no, that's not it. I have is the M3 voicing prototype. It's basically this big silver box with a piece of paper on the top. That says what the parameters do. And that's all we got to make the patches. And then we had to discover, explore, work on the synth, come up with the sounds. And then we would go to Japan for both program meetings. And then we'd come back after we had selected the programs and we'd work for another four or six months on the combinations. And then we'd all fly back to Japan and we'd have another meeting to go through the voicing yet again for the combinations for these things. So it was... It was a wonderful time and era, and you know? He sounds on a David Foster or Quincy Jones session, and they'd go, Steve, great sound. And I'd go, well, what can I say? You know, you either got it or you don't, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and you got it. <laughs> I take a deep bow, you know what I mean? For my Well, hard and you work. did it. I mean, do, ca- <laughs> putting the sounds together, I mean, you, it's very easy to put a couple sounds and have a horrible sound, too. So you got to give yourself credit, my friend. Come on. I know, but I just, uh, you know, I, because I did that for a living too, on a different, you know what I mean? I, right. I did that. Uh, um, I've always never wanted to get amnesia about, uh, you know, where a lot of this stuff came from or the guys that, the guys that did a lot of this hard work. You know it's a I team. Mean? Takes a village, right? Well, appreciative of all that, yeah. you know. Wow. And that process was real, you know, intense in those days, that back and forth at Japan. Oh, my God. Yes. I saw it at Yamaha up close. Yes. Them, some of the same, you know what I mean? The same Very kind similar. Of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. It, it used to be more of a committee than it is anymore because budgets and staff and so forth. But uh, let's see. Hopefully, uh, let's see. see what other people are saying really quick here. Uh, Guys, do you have any more questions? We have about five minutes left with the interview part of the live stream. Um, what was your most fun Michael Jackson session? Because you were involved on virtually every one of his albums, I understand, uh, minus a, the lightest one he did, Invincible. I wasn't on that. Uh, but but uh, yeah, I worked on all of them. Uh, um, and they were always great experiences. Quincy Jones was a great producer. Bruce Swedeen was yeah. an amazing engineer. To have an engineer like Bruce, yeah, uh, you know, you know, just a, a a tip. You know, you got very good at working with people. Your diplomacy skills had to be. You know, when we all work in our little studios by ourselves, and it's just all us, and you know, we do whatever the hell we want to do. When you're working with other people, uh, uh, right? And if an engineer didn't dig what you were doing by the way they can make your life miserable and oh, yeah. i got uh i thought uh a smart thing i would like to do uh, and especially on michael jackson sessions was i'd go you know for instance trying to get a string sound or get a, a great pad sound or something like that you know they'd often get cloudy and muddy i didn't like to have bright filter sounds you know i was trying to to me that sounded like a synthesizer and i'm right. trying to get my to sound not sound like a synthesizer so a lot of my 
string sounds would get very muddy or whatever. And uh, when it was having trouble, Quincy was big about listening to your sound on the oritones, these tiny speakers to see, you know, he goes, he goes, Svens, let's hear what it's going to sound like on the radio. You know, and they'd play it really <laughs> soft on these really small speakers. And if your sound didn't speak, they would kind of, right. you know, they, they'd pass on it. Now, oritones don't so- lie. So what I would do is I immediately before I would even, you know, yeah, I had high pass filters and I had maybe some EQ of my own or whatever, but I'd go to Bruce Witte and the engineer. I'd go, Spence, help me out, bail me out. You know what I mean? My low end's kind of cloudy here. And I'd get him involved in the sound and invested in the sound. And uh, you'd have, you'd stand a better chance. He would kind of turn it up a little bit louder than he might normally would have. Um, wow. But overall, Michael, it's great to work with. Quincy was great to work with. And um, my favorite session was probably, of course, human nature, because it just kind of click, click, clicked. We kind of, yeah. I knew just what I wanted to do. And uh, um, they were great experiences. What did it feel like listening to these tracks that now are so iconic, right? But you got to hear them when they were being built. Did you get goose pimples on some of these? And like, like, I would I would think there'd be almost an awe feeling in like just to be in in that experience. Do, or did you just work at the time and just do your thing? And because sometimes I look back at things I've done, like, you know, people are they think of the things that we've done in the past. Back then, I was just doing my job. So I wasn't, you know. Where were you yeah. at on that spectrum of just. There was there was some of that what you're talking about. It just was it was a job. And like I said, I I mean, later on, even guys like Quincy would let me take tapes home so I could work on stuff without them all around. They understood, you know, Quincy used to say, you know, working on synthesizers on stuff, it got to be like painting a 747 with a toothbrush was the phrase he would use (laughs) time. It started taking, especially when guys the more guys got into computers and tweaking and there are more options that there were with stuff it it got to be uh um yeah more you know what i mean where he'd let me take tapes somewhere that would be unheard of to work on stuff right on your own but at the time like you said sometimes it was just a job and you did the best you had three or four songs to do in right. your three-hour session right you couldn't and and belabor stuff and so sometimes it was just you had to deliver and you weren't thinking about it that much. And some of the things after the fact, you go, oh, I wish I had that one back. I would have, could have done this. And other things go, you go, wow, sometimes they're giving me chills now in 2023. And I, you know what I mean? For something yeah. I did right back then, you know. That's awesome. I mean, because in fact, someone was asking the, um, uh, the portamento synth pad in human nature. What, what, what synth was that? Yeah, that was me being inspired. Michael's previous album, Off the Wall, there was a song, uh, there was a Stevie Wonder song called I Can't Help It. I worked on three songs on that album, but I did not work on that song. Michael Boddicker, who was one of Quincy's go-to synth guys, worked on that. And he did a thing with an Oberheim four voice. This is when there was just the four expander modules. Right. And when it went into Portamento, it was true polyphonic Portamento. There were four separate monophonic synthesizers sliding around from note to note. And there was this real cool synth part in, in the song, I Can't Help It. So that, that inspired me. But what I did on Human Nature is I had an Oberheim 4 voice and I put it in mono mode and I'd hit one note on the bottom so that all this, they all went to the one note. And then I'd put it in polyphonic mode with, with the glissando on, with the uh, portamento on and go up to this chord, the chord I wanted to go up to. So it would ah. slide, all slide up from this bottom note, up and they'd break apart and slide into this chord. Wow. And that was kind of how I got that part on Human Nature at the beginning of the uh, from So the a bit of a THX, kind of a starting from one point and then they are gonna deviate to the notes. Yeah. Beautiful, love it. That's a great, that's a great technique, I mean. Mm-hmm. And you can't always do that on, uh, some modern sense here it yeah. doesn't it doesn't a lot of them yeah you can go in a, you can go into uh unison and then put it in four voice and and uh uh hit a chord up high but yeah i've got results with a lot of plugins 
One thing that's fun with Guru Sampler and Unify is that pitch bin up and down are different parameters. And then there's a glide parameter next to it, which is a lag processor. So you can actually set it. I have like an eight layer patch where you play it and then you move the pitch bin and it goes, each thing goes to its own separate note. It's such, here, I got to share that with you because I should work on that sound. We should make a preset of that. That's made for doing that. Totally. Let's see. Where is it at? Lead sound. It's the 64X Monster Glide. For those of you with Unify, you play one note and then move the pitch wheel up. And if you go down, it goes to octaves. It's actually, you can make it so instead of a chord, it's... So, I love that. Independent stuff like that. I mean, that's where such fun things can come from. So it's cool to hear about that with the Oberheim technique because that's that's very different because you're starting from one point and then you're going to this chord each oscillator oper each, each module actually independently. It's very fun. Very cool. Yeah. Let's see here. Uh, any other questions? Uh, did your software ever bombed out during a live performance? Talking to me? Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, uh, <laughs> as far as soft live performance, um, my last, I started uh, after a, quite a long absence, I started touring again with Toto in like 2010. And I started using main stage. Ah. Uh, I didn't have software, so to speak, live before that. It was all synths. Right. Hardware. A lot of MIDI, but uh, uh, it was all synths before, you know, just individual synths before that. So, I would use main stage with a laptop all loaded into an older uh, uh, Mac laptop. And absolutely, the guys knew they'd look over at me and I'd be going like this, you know, I'm <laughs> talk, stretch, work the crowd. You know what I mean? I need a minute, you know, because <laughs> I went totally main stage. I totally I, I love the main stage and I love the promise of main stage. And, and mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And uh, it wasn't just some little add-on. I mean, most guys are sensible enough to have some keyboard that always worked, uh, that was always on. Me, I was like 100% main stage. So when it went down, I was down. You know, I didn't even have the, the audio outputs weren't even hooked up from my keyboards. You know, they were just controllers. Like guitar solo. <laughs> guitar solo. <laughs> Drum solo. <laughs> Hey guys, this has been a yes. pleasure, but I have run, unfortunately. Yes. Um I, I promise I'll be back soon to uh yes to some as just a regular guy learning from you, all of you guys. Oh, okay. Anytime. You're welcome to join us anytime, my friend. Thank you Vince, so much for being here. Right. There's always so much to learn. None of us can be uh Oh, there it is. None of us all by any stretch. Yeah. Um and I'm sure John, you know, you know, I consider guys like you and Jack are such such uh pros but i know you guys learn from talking to people you know what i mean there's yeah. always there's always so much to learn and there's so many cool things out there and we can't all you know be under the hood of all of them so i love this stuff and these opportunities so thank you and well, thank uh, you thanks for it's a pleasure to have you here and we'll do it again work really amazing work dude yes you thank know thank you so much thank you so much thank i mean it I mean it. It's really going to come in handy for a lot of people, I think. Yes. You know? Yes. Especially the yes. next couple of years. Yeah. And he's way. ahead of the curve. That's what's awesome, too. I mean, I'm telling you, you've got it now. There's a whole bunch of these library companies, I think, are going to be needing what you're doing. So, yeah. Take care, wow. everyone. All right. Talk to cool. you. All right. All right. Good to see you. Bye bye. Thank you so much. All right. So, Bob, you're still here? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, that was fun. That was an experience. <laughs> well, amazing. It's your fault, man. You did it. To... <laughs> <laughs> it was a good thing then. <laughs> Thank you for doing so. Yes. Um, hey, do you guys have any questions for Bob? Since Bob is still here for a bit, if you have questions on this library, it's just, I can't wait to show people this library. There's a video walkthrough on the library. Uh, lots of people are loving it. If you ha have the library and you enjoy it, please write a review for us. That would be really okay. helpful. Let us know your thoughts. That feedback just helps us keep getting better and 
making sure that we're doing what we're doing and so forth. Um, uh, I could listen to all these stories. He was uh, this. Oh, I know. I know. Stories, I, you know, I'm the kind of guy who could listen all day just to learn what was going on then. It was, it was uh, amazing times. I did just a small yeah. number of sessions compared to what, I mean, Steve was an icon for like 20, 30 years in the scene. And I had a guy doing cartage and taking my racks to do sessions for a couple of different people. And, and it's, it's, it's a kind of a weird pressure because you have to have the brass sound and people had like the, whatever was on the radio was the sound you were trying to do better than because you didn't have, you know, it wasn't, there was no Spotify. There was no reference to every song ever created. It was just whatever was on the radio was like, did you hear this new sound from boys to men? We want a brass sound like that. And so you'd have to figure out how to create something like that or better. And then it had to fit the song. You know, you can make this great sound and then it doesn't work for what they need in the track. So. Right. But then it, again, like uh, we said before, you know, the, the, there were teams back then. There were many people involved. And I think that played a huge role yes. to what was going on because yes. now it's completely yes. different. Yes. Completely. Yes. Some, some of the music that we love is because it was a whole bunch of brains. Right. Involved. It was a teamwork. And yeah. that teamwork and the, him turning it to Bruce for the engineering to do something to the sound. Uh, it's, a lot of people. A, lot of people. a chain of people. Many people. Yeah. It's really hard to do that uh, when it's just you and you're EQing your own sounds and your, your own yeah. music. And it's it's all me, you know. And so that's not necessarily as strong as it can be when it's a team. It's it's an interesting thing. But uh, yeah, yeah. So we should just start little circle, little groups in our towns and stuff like that. <laughs> you know? Be cool. Yeah. Well, you know, the, 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 who knows where the future goes with all this stuff. But um, let's see. Uh, Bob, uh, have you given any thoughts to what your next Unify library will be? Guys, <laughs> <laughs> his next library is going to be getting married, I believe, right? Uh, right. That's right. <laughs> I'm going to get married. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, uh, your wedding is next month. It's uh, 30 September, September 30. Yeah. The day after my daughter's <laughs> birthday. Great, great, great day. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. September oh, wow. 29 is her, is her birthday. So that's great. So then we'll, if you buy the we'll library, you're contributing to Bob's fund for getting married as well. So another reason to support the cause, <laughs> because we all know <laughs> weddings are a big experience. But that is I'm very happy for you. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank yes. you very much. And everybody's saying congratulations in the chat, of course. Thank um, you, everybody. Let's see. How do you know the time? Uh, oh, yeah. So for those asking about the patch count, I'll show that stuff in a minute when we do Unify stuff. Uh, may your future be as sweet as your wedding cake. I love that. <laughs> 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 Thank That's you. That's sweet. Um, so let me ask you this. Um, what was the re? I, I I think I know the reason because it's we talked about it and you and Vital is so accessible since it's free. That was one of the main reasons you chose to use Vital. Yes, I, it, because it was looking modern. Um, I my the first synthesizer that I tried to learn uh, was um, Massive, the old one, and then I tried uh, Zero. I. I actually learned a lot uh, of synthesis with Serum. And the last one that I tried was Vital. And, uh, you know, when I tried Vital, it felt like mm, this is the synth I want to use. This is like, I have an understanding for it. Yeah. It's, it, it comes more natural. I don't know how to explain it. You know, yeah. I just felt comfortable basically with it. And yeah, um, yeah that, that was the reason. And it, and it was free. Of right. course, I, right. although I have paid for an extra version, but um, right. I like the fact that it has a free version. Yes. I like that. Well, it yeah. helps for us because um, we did a library for Serum by Airwave, which is great, but you have to own Serum. And Serum right. is not, there is not a free version of Serum. And right. for a lot of people, they couldn't afford Serum or they didn't own it, didn't want to. So that that limited the library in some respects. 
What's nice is that everybody has access to vital. If you can, uh, we do ask for you to please support the developer, Matt Titel. Uh, yes. It's a great synth. I'll be doing probably this week a video tutorial on getting into Vital from ground zero just to, to, to show people the layout because it is a very friendly synthesizer to work with. Yeah, it looks really good. It's it, and, and it, I was going to ask a couple of things because I was noting this when doing the walkthrough, one of the guitars, um, because one thing that's cool with Vital is that it has the ability to play a sample as an oscillator. Right. Yes. Yes. And one of your guitars, you had that same sample, I think, in a form of synthesis. You turn into a, a was it a wavetable of the guitar? Right. So it has three three modes, and one of them is a, a splice mode, as it is called. And I, I think I used that one. And um, I actually I have experimented a lot. You can experiment with different modes, and then within the sample, Again, there are different things that you can try and change the sample. And I was experimenting, actually. Right. So I don't have a lot of sounds made with samples in this library uh, because mainly it's mostly synthesis. The idea was to make sounds like in the 80s. They were using synths, right? So I had to use the synth, synthesis, basically. Right. Right. But I've created some more sophisticated sounds and some I've done also some experiments and I've used samples I've used. Um, this spectral morphing techniques and other things. Right. But, you know, mostly I try to fall under uh, this category of sounds that I was needing to uh, produce 80s music. And that's why later, at the later stage, I did these reconstructions of these popular songs to actually make sure right, right. <laughs> that I'm heading in the right direction. And that's when I told you, oh, yeah, it's, it's, it's going well. It sounds it's really going really good. good. Yeah, it sounds really good. So I was, yeah, yeah, I was trying to to make this happen. And they, I did it. Basically. Because I'm not experienced in synthesis like you are. I'm, <laughs> I'm not doing this for many years. I, I started in 2020 only. Right. So, well, well, well yeah, you you understand what you're doing well enough to get your ideas across and and right. get the. I mean, it helps being such. You're a very good producer, and you know how right. to respect sound so that all together it equals this. And I think right. that's a great strength to have because you could put the sounds together and see how they worked and perfected it to where they just. I mean, it's really sweet. Yeah. It's really sweet. It's uh, very impressive right. to have okay. uh, this sonic wall coming out from all the different patches. So congrats on that. I always wanted to do that for the 80s. always wanted to, to have, you know, all sorts of all these sounds in a place, in one place. And I did it. You did. High five. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, all right. Well, let me show the library to everybody. Yeah. And Great. thank you so much for joining us. I thank you. Oh, no, it's 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 good stuff, man. And uh, yes, we who knows where Bob will go next, but you know it's going to be a fun adventure that we will all be thrilled with when we get there. But uh, good luck with your wedding and uh, honeymoon and all that wonderful stuff. So happy for you. And uh, thank you again for, for bringing this to us to release. I mean, it's it's an honor. Oh, and thank you for making it happen. Because hey, some problems, yeah. Thank takes you. a team, yeah. like you're talking about. It takes a team, yes, takes you know. Team. Can't important. do it by yourself. So appreciate. It. Okay. All right. Thank so, you. So bye, everyone. I'll be in the chat. Anything you want? Any questions? Yes. Yeah, I'll be there. Thank okay. you. Okay. All right, everybody. Sign oh, up. So great. Ah. Oh. Oh, what a fun, fun, fun thing! Oh my gosh, I am I am the luckiest guy to get to bring this stuff like this to you guys. So. Uh, so this new library back to the 80s is right here uh i have it at 279 what did i do to the library to change the order so it's not 282 uh i believe 292 is the is that right what did i do let me see something real quick hold on Don't look at my patch count because I might have messed something up here. So I'm not sure what the story is here. 
uh, contents. Yeah, it's supposed to be a different number than you're seeing. So I'm not sure why it's showing you that, but don't lose sleep. This is not the final count. The one that you have should have 292 patches, I think. Or did I? 79, 89. Uh, me? I wonder if it's because I counted the templates, but the templates aren't there. Anyway. It's 279 or two. what do you guys have for your final patch count? I'm curious. <laughs> Say in the chat what the patch count is. Mine says 279. Okay. You know what it is? I'll tell you what it is. So we had, and I can show you these probably in logic, these BPM templates. There is another, I think this is 13 patches. And so that would have put it at 292. Um there were, BP, there were these templates where it played the MIDI files for everything for these songs, just like you hear in the demo. But we don't own the licensing to give you those songs. And we didn't want to get into a deal with publishing and the songwriting companies behind all these songs uh, trying to get a royalty for the MIDI files. And so we decided not to include the MIDI files. And so we pulled those patches out. So 279, I think, is the final count. Um, because you have the templates here. And what these have, let's see here, I have to have complete control running so I can change MIDI channels on this. I don't know how to get to the keyboard MIDI channel. Uh, hurry up. It's okay. So if I go over here, um, what quit? Yeah. So if I go over here, I can go to the keys. So on these patches, if you call up something like Africa, when you play one note to start, you have the drum groove, right? How's the compressor in between the music and my voice? I want to make sure that I'm not louder than the synthesizer parts. But on different MIDI channels, as you can see, I have the bass, brass, right? So um, the, the sequence Originally, the template had all the MIDI files for this. We pulled those out just because we realized we, we can't do that. We can't give you the songs without licensing and so forth. So this has the parts of the drums, because the drum grooves, you know? It's, okay, good, it's balanced, good, okay. And then on the other channels, you have the bass. And you have, uh, piano part and then on part four you have the other keyboard part and then Bob had the sequence and if you listen to the demo sequences you can hear the parts and <laughs> it nails them quite well but what's nice with these is you can call these up it gives you the drum groove oh wait I need to be on my channel one Right? And if you want, you can hit the little bypass buttons here and then you can sequence, I don't know what's going on. Show MIDI has been acting very strange lately. So I can turn it off and turn it on and it's, let's see if I have it go away and come back. It's uh, It's got a mind of its own just to kind of like, let's see if this will work. So. Show MIDI, stretch it to be nice and wide. There we go. It might get stuck at some point. We'll, we'll keep an eye on it. Um, but you have the drum groove, or you can turn those off and have the drums. And then you have all of the parts after that. So you can immediately start writing. Like if we take this down, let's quit Unify, standalone. I can go over here to Logic. And here, let's have this go away. I can turn on Unify and let's call up this library. And let's, I'll see if I can get this to work for you guys so you can see how this works. Um, I pushed the wrong button, but it's going to check really quick. So if I go here and hide that, here's Tribit. I call them illegal versions because it's the MIDI data. <laughs> let's go Tribute Sequence. So if I go over here to Let's see, back to the 80s. Oh, no, this one. Um, 
and we go to let's go to a template like never give you up never going to give you up right now if i go over here and i say never going to give you up uh don't do that and then i as this is where i can show steve we can say midi channel one in channel one, out channel one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And if I bring these up, we'll see if we can get this to work. This is just a quick test. I say start and cycle. Okay, it's sort of working. Oh, you know what I gotta do, I think, is go to this patch inside of Unify and turn off the MIDI boxes because we don't need those because the sequence data is there. But as you can see, let's, let's have these transposed down an octave. So we're going to say transpose. Anyway, the MIDI data is there. As you can see, it kind of can play them. So I, I still have the MIDI data, but it's not in Unify. We don't want to get into a, a copyright infringement. So what I did, uh, just to shorten this story from being way too laborious, is I, I gave you guys the templates with the patches just as they are for the demo songs that you hear at the website, minus the MIDI data. So if you put in the MIDI data for the bass, and the keys and so forth, you can recreate the tracks and it sounds extremely good. It sounds just like the demo songs. So that is an option if you want to play with it. And what I think is even more interesting and more worthwhile is to use these setups to write, write new music. Now that you have these sounds in your toolkit to work with, um, you can, like, like Steve was saying, people are asking for tons of 80s music. It's, and Yacht Rock, all the uh, Christopher Cross and David Pax, Ambrosia and stuff like that types of albums from back in the day. That's a really big sound right now. And this library can, can pull that off really, really well. So there's these BPM templates. Let me show you other things in the library. Anything that you see that's like a, a bass like this, it's calling up a simple vital patch. And I need to go over here. Not simple vital patch, I should say just a vital patch. And then here is that patch. And again, I'll I'll as as a bonus for this library, I will put out a a video tutorial covering vital and how it works so that those of you that are just getting vital to work with this library can have a better understanding of how the synthesizer works. Uh, it's extremely powerful and pretty straightforward. You get to see pretty much everything in front of you. Here are your oscillators. Here are your two filters. Here are your envelopes. Here's your LFOs. And the LFOs can do some really powerful things really easily that are really, really fun to experiment with. Then you get into all the different controllers here for velocity. And there's two randomizers for putting randomization into the parameters. and stuff. It's just, it's wonderful. Uh, if let's see if we go up here and um, let's say initialize preset right here's unison the tune is right here and what's so fun is you can uh, learn MIDI to something really quickly so you can just using the mod wheel to change unison but detune Or if you want, let's say clear, if I want an LFO to do that, all you have to do is click. And when you see this little tiny little circle thing, you just drag and then you let go over what parameter you want it to control and it's connected. And you see the shape of the LFO and you see the parameter go up and down and you have a little circle that's your strength.
So it's really easy to modulate all sorts of things with this. If you turn on a filter, and then you go to this LFO and you click and you drag. Before I've even let up, I can drag over a parameter and hear it. And then once you've let up, you've got the strength. So it's really fun to program and work with. I'll go into more details in a video to show you. A, we'll make, make a patch from scratch type of a video or something like that. Uh, but if you have Vital, some of the fun things, this little paint, and you can choose what shape you want it to do. Let's say we'll have it do a step. And then you choose the timing value, say eighth notes. And now if, if I turn on the paintbrush, if I just go like this, it's painting. And I go steps, and I want it to go down. So now these are downs. And if I say to go to like 16th, now I'm drawing in 16th notes. So you can quickly make rhythmic things like so easily and so much fun. So very, very fun stuff. So we'll, we'll cover this in more detail, but Vital is a crazy powerful synthesizer. Those of you that love Serum and the ability to like modulate the F, do frequency modulation between different oscillators. Um, do a sine wave, turn on the second oscillator that's a sawtooth, but turn down the volume. But this can be used over here as FM from oscillator two. And now you could take this paintbrush and do all this painting stuff like that and then have this be assigned to the FM. I mean, it's it's disgustingly crazy fun how you can do creative things with this with this program, this plugin really easily. It's really, really great. So that's used for all of these patches. It's calling up Vital. So the key is to make sure you have Vital. The key is to make sure Vital is up. Oh, we haven't had this problem happen in a while. Let's see here. Call back up, unify. Uh, let's see. Ah, uh, we haven't seen that. That that was supposed to not be happening anymore. Uh, okay, so we do have all these different patches that are calling it vital. Um, let me see what the chat's saying. I haven't been paying attention to you guys. Uh, yeah, vital sounds very good. It is a great synthesizer. Let's get some of these applications going that I don't need to necessarily have running. We need OBS. <laughs> uh, we don't need Spotify. Okay, so that is a more simpler system. Uh, for those of you curious where to find this, this is at the PluginGuru.com website. Let's go over here to view. Here is PluginGuru.com. The other thing I should point out is that FM8 is available for $10. Uh, the first library that Plugin Guru released over uh, in 2009 uh, was for FM8. And let's open this in a new tab at Plugin Boutique. Uh, it is available for $10. And so I have a link right here on this page to that page. And as long as it's available for $10, I will keep a link here. And I have decided we unified both libraries made them both available for the price of one library as a toxic power bundle. And I should point out also if um, FM8 is a great synthesizer. Each one of these power packs for FM8, A, you got to use the VST3 version because the updated version of FM8 is using uh, the VST3 version so that it's compatible with Apple Silicone. <laughs> Great sound. Down here, I made 10 bonus patches that combine all these FM8 patches. Let's see, let's get our mix right here. So you have 10 bonus patches that do play with nice pianos.
right? Now, the Toxic Effemate Library is a little different in that it's really an aggressive in your face. Um, this was back when Skrillex was a big face. So these bonus patches are definitely more like trying to just wipe your face off and play. So the two together, the Toxic Power Bundle is at a reasonable price and FM8 is $10. So I want to make sure you were aware of that. And um, this library, let's go back to the back to the 80s. I just want to do a little side thing to make sure you guys knew about that. Um, let's see. Yeah. Oh, you guys are welcome. Yeah. I mean, I, actually, I think somebody else told me, I think Shane told me or who someone else told me about FM8 being, uh, actually it was Shane. Yeah. And then Shane helped me. We, tri we, we unified all the patches. He helped make that happen. God bless his soul. Thank you. Mad shout out to Shane. And uh, can you show us how you create a song from those song patches? Sure. Let's do that. Uh, so, if we're going to go over, we're in Logic, we're in our DAW at this point, right? So, I'm going to go to, we could use, let's do this. Let's use one of, we could, because these are the same things as those song templates, except these were composed by Bob. So, right? It's the same, you'd have to set these up a little bit more. So, let's, let's do first with one of these. Let's say, get into the groove. Let's play with this one. Right, so we got the groove. I'm gonna get Logic up here so you can see its interface. And we'll just write a quick little ditty song. Um, let me shrink this so that it doesn't take up as much real estate. Now, the key in your DAW is to get so that you have multi-channel support. And here I have output channels. And then if I have it set like that and I hold down Control and hit Return, inside of logic it will continue to make the same plugin but advance the midi channel so this way i have the drums two is going to be the bass three so i could go through each one of these and say this is the brass i think this is right and this is the bass oh i didn't do the right place bass and here's my drums um, I, I could name them this way, right? So four is a eight bit pluck, eight bit pluck, just so I see what I've got. And then the keys is right here. D key, piano DX. And then I get to decide whether I want to use on channel one, the drum group, Or I could turn them off by hitting the bypass. And, and Bob very, very wisely mapped this so that the percussion and these drum grooves can fit together as a general MIDI map. Because the drums, if I turn on the keyboard, these are playing your standard general MIDI. And then up here for the percussion, And it did round robins, so it's more than one sample. Or is it velocity? Anyway. It sounds great. It sounds great. So let's let's bypass MIDI box. I'm gonna play my own drum groove in. So we let's see. Gotta have, make sure I have my click. Okay, so there I am. So because I've set up, the key here is setting up your DAW so that it's talking to the same instrument but a different MIDI channel. And then if I want a different patch, I could just open Vital, click the little library and go to the MC uh, back to the 80s and here's all the... Maybe I want that bass.
off and on and off, right? So go to channel five. Let's do it in minor. <laughs> I got to put a little fusion attitude in there. So. Let's go to the plucky part. Why didn't my drums play? I don't, I don't. Oh, the volume went down. So it's that easy. You call up the template and then you just play whatever you want to play. And you're right. It's 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 that easy. <laughs> well, if I can do Ax, well, we could do Axel F, but no, we won't do it. But anyway, that's how easy it is to use these. And it, let's say, eh, I don't want to use that. Let's try a different patch. I could go to Unify, and because this template is set up in my DAW, save this song as your starting point. Uh, because now I could go. Let's let's get a little bit more complex. Let's say we're gonna call up. Let's be on MIDI channel one, so I can play these and hear them because these are listening to MIDI channel one for the most part, uh, at least just to make sure it's working, right? So I could call up one of these that... Say I wanted to use this. I'm gonna do a Tame Impala kind of thing. So hold down Option, and you can use that to click to remove all of the MIDI boxes. And now you need to go to each one of these where it says All for the MIDI input, and change it so that it progresses one, two, three, four. Each layer in Unify can be a MIDI channel or combined if you want, but these right now just start off with make them separate MIDI channels. And then let's shrink this down in size so that I can move this over here again. And um, now on the drums track. I have this whole different vibe drum kit. So let's. Okay, so we have ourselves a little drum groove. Uh, two is percussion, so we're gonna go to three. Here's our bass. So then it's it's just songwriting. It's writing it's that simple you've got the the sounds to work with um and if you need more than these sounds to work with all you have to do at this point um say you wanted to include let's say a guitar part we don't have a guitar in this track so you'd go down to the guitars and let's say we wanted to add ballet which is a really nice chord little i could use it for chord strums right click and because I know that this is just a vital patch, I can say add instrument one layer to current patch. The other way to do this instead of a right click is down in the bottom corner. I can barely see it from my camera. Set it to instrument one 
And this way, when I click this, same thing, it just loads the ballet guitar. Now go over here to the all on input and changes to be MIDI channel six. And now it's ready to go. So let's set this back to normal so I don't get lost. And if I go like this, and if I go to channel six, do I have six? Here it is. So I could say guitar. So we could go. Let me do it one more time. What happens it turns down the drum volume i don't understand <laughs> something in here is oh it might be show midi doing show midi's been doing some funny things lately so let's turn that off let's see. Uh. It's just songwriting. It's now it's up to you to come up with the arrangement and the melodies. Sing a beautiful sound over the top of it, but you have access to all these cool sounds. They work. It's awesome. just need George Michael to come over and sing and uh, off you go. So that's how the library works. All right. Cool. Uh, any other questions? I think we'll wrap it up here. Um, we are at our end of live stream point. Uh, hey, Greg, good to see my friend Gregory Ives. He has an incredible studio doing Dolby Atmos mixes here in Portland. It's just wonderful. Uh, good stuff. Good stuff. All right. So let's go up here. Off. Well, thank you for joining us. It has been a pleasure to have Mr. Steve Picaro join us. That was a wonderful trip down the past. I mean, working in the 80s had to be such, I mean, it was really the boom of MIDI and all of these synthesizers had matured. We were past the, the starting points of the synthesizer just playing and staying in tune. Now they were able to get more complex and we could layer them and do all these really fun things with them. And you can hear in this library a lot of that kind of uh, approach. I mean, some of these are just so wonderful. <laughs> So awesome. And it's all synthesis. These are not samples. All of these vinyl synthesizers are calling up true synthesized, made on the spot synthesizer patches. So it's not one of those things where it's a famous 80s library where Somebody went back and tried to sample these synthesizers playing the actual patches. Those never work. I've never heard of any of those libraries that have the vibe. It just becomes too clinical. I don't know what it is, but this has this, there's this glue to the sound. It just works. Especially with Bob's mixes. I'm, <laughs> I'm messing him up here, but... uh. So these 16 are compositions by Bob. Um, you're free to use the music as starting points and build the songs around them. Uh, so that is part of the, the package. I, I, it'd be great if you let us know if you're going to do such a thing and so forth. Uh, can you give an example with the MIDI? Um, examples with MIDI. Uh, yeah, well, I don't think I can release the MIDI files. Um, I have to do some checking with lawyers to find out about that. I, I don't want to do something that we're not allowed to do since we are a company and those are the songs. And Bob very, very carefully 
um, went through, in some cases, all the verses and choruses and bridges of the songs. So if you hold down a note, it plays the whole tracks. And um, I'm not so sure that we can release that. Yeah, the glue is for sure. <laughs> yeah, Miami Vice outfit. I've got the pink and different colors behind me to kind of have a bit of the Miami Vice kind of vibe because, uh, you know, the, the 80s was all about really cool neon colors and stuff like that. Uh, you guys are great. Um, uh, guys, Peaches, you're welcome. Just, just happy to have something fun to show you guys and bring to your attention really cool libraries. And this is one... Uh, it can't get any more wonderful than just someone sitting in the library and saying, hey, do you want to put this out? And it's like, are you kidding? This is incredibly... <laughs> go get your uh, little outfit on and go to the gym. And... <laughs> right? <laughs> Dubes is unified. I love it. Right? Yes. Bob says, thank you for tuning in. I say thank you for tuning in. If you have any questions, <laughs> push it to the limit. Oh, yeah. Hey, you'll love this one. Uh, Ryland, check this out. Roller Disco. It's kind of got that new attitude kind of a thing. And Go Tigers was fun for the... Uh... Give me a T. Give me an I. G-E-R. Yay! <laughs> uh, this one's fun. Cocktail and Dreams is fun. Um, check this out. This one is... Uh... I love the spirit of this one. And there's no drums. So you can go up here to the BPM drum grooves and do this. If you're gonna do this, right click and load as a unified layer. Because then you can do a couple things. Number one, you can open up MIDI box and set it to halftime. And then you can click here and there's all these other, oh wait, these this has all the parts playing. Oh, this is Summer Kiss. Look over here. Choose a different group. Go to the tuning. And if you want to get the Phil Collins effect, let me show you really quickly. If you go to Unify's Reverb to Clang Falta, we're going to add some Clang Falta. And if you go here to the browser, you can click right here. In Back to the 80s, Bob has included two large gate audio impulse responses. So we could go to the large one. And then bring the end down to about 15%. And then shape it a little bit. And you get that really horrible. Let's take this to normal tempo speed. <laughs> And then, here's another cool trick. Say you want to pull out the kick and snare to be processed differently so that the kick doesn't have the reverb, right? MIDI box has right here this include or exclude filtering for the key range. So play it. Kick is out. I'm going to bring this down. It's just the snare, right? There's another track playing a percussion part, but don't worry about that. So I'm going to say um, include notes for this layer. 
for the snare to have the reverb. And then you go over here and say duplicate layer, uh, turn off clang falter, and then go to MIDI box. And instead of include notes, go to exclude notes. So this means it's going to ignore the snare and play everybody else. And I have turned off clang falter. So now. Now I have the snare. But the, the other drums don't have, are not going through that same clang falter effect. So it's very easy if you want to duplicate the layers to get separate sounds out of the mix of one drum groove. You could go to any of these drum grooves. Let's just go BPM drum. Call up one of these guys like Lin Dram. Right? All you have to do is go to MIDI box, take this up above C3. Let's see. Let's say D. Okay, so there's the snare, right? So I'm going to duplicate this. And on the second one, instead of include notes, I'm going to say exclude. So that way, I can have the drums dry. Snare, I can process it with reverb, whatever I want to do. I could take it to a different pitch. Right? Put different EQ. It's, it's really easy to use in that way to take one of these drum grooves. And just by using the include, exclude, you can map it so that you get the kick and the snare separate uh, from each other. And the main thing is to get the snare separated from the groove if you want to use it and stuff like that. Um, cool. I love the simple and clear interface. Days, thank you. A lot of people in the early days thought Unify's interface was simple. <laughs> and the, the reason it was simple is because I, I just, you know, we now have the ability to change the layer colors so you can change these to be different colors if you want and so forth. Uh, we've decided not to do that for the libraries and let that be more something you guys choose for the layer and colors and stuff like that uh, to make sense for what how you're using it in your productions and stuff like that. But the whole goal is to make this as transparent to where it's it it just, you know what you can do and can't do, and then it's up to you to write music with it. So thank you for saying that. I appreciate that. Uh, best tip you heard all month. Oh, cool. Well, there you go. Glad to, glad to be there for you. All right, we're going to wrap out. There is so much, as someone is saying, potential in this library. There's 279 patches. I'm going to go fix the website. Sorry about that. That says 292. Uh, all of these patches are wonderful. Some are simple. And remember, you can go down here to normal, say, layer one. You can go to any other library. I could go to the FM8 Power Pack. I could go down here to that really cool glamorous keys. Let's say we want to use the Unify layer because I want to load the whole thing. I can say glamorous piano and load that. And then I need to transpose this up. So the bottom left option is transpose. Now I need an 80s pad with this. Let's go back to back to the 80s. Uh, to the pads. And let's say like Journey. This would be nice and Okay. All right. Well, thank you all. We will see you next week with another live stream. Don't forget, FM8 is $10. This library is now out, and it's at introductory price until September 3rd. So grab it, and we thank you so much for your support. Bob's getting married, so this is a wonderful way to say thank you, get a killer library, and it will help Bob have a wonderful wedding. So all all kind, of, kind of comes together in a great synergistic timing. So, And thank you to Steve Picaro for joining us for this live stream. Wonderful, wonderful time. All right. We will see you guys again. Thank you again.
We appreciate your support so much. All right. Have a great day. Be creative. Have a killer week. Go out. Be inspiring in everything you do. We, we bring us along for the ride. Okay. All right. See you guys later.